So, uh, I don't really need to introduce you. I think everyone knows you here. So, Ben Edmonds, thank cool. you. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Are we good? All right. Uh, so first off, this country is beautiful. By the way, it's my first time here. I'm really enjoying myself. Thank you for having me. Uh, conference is great. Seb and team, you're doing an amazing job. All right, let's get started. So this talk is Modern and Secure PHP. The idea behind this is really to kind of walk you through what's changed recently. And by recently, I mean the last few years in PHP. Maybe point out some things you're not using or have seen around and don't quite understand. Also, some things that are coming down the pipe that you will see soon if you had yet to see. Mostly so you can recognize it, know what's going on, know how to use it. Um, hopefully, you learn a few things here. There's not going to be anything very in-depth. It's just kind of a quick overview. We're also going to try to do it pretty quickly to get you out of here in time. So I'm probably going to fly through some things. And feel free to grab me afterwards if there's anything you want more details on. Who am I? I am Ben Edmonds. Uh, ben Edmonds on Twitter, no spaces. Feel free to hit me up on there. Also, if you have any questions later you want to uh, chat about, anything you want to dig into, you can get me there. I do some open source work, mostly with the CodeIgniter PHP framework in the past. Also, I'm still a bit involved. I'm on their steering committee and security teams. The framework, if you know it from back in the day, used to be fairly popular. It's uh, recently not been as much because it wasn't updated for a while. But it's under new ownership, new collaborators, new repos, and it will be having a new version hopefully sometime next year. I wrote a book on building secure PHP apps, which I will give you a coupon code for at the end. It would be great if you could check that out. I do the PHP Town Hall podcast with Phil Sturgeon, which you've probably seen around somewhere here. Uh, he has a horrible English accent. And I'm the CTO at Mindfulware. We do insurance and medical software, mostly PHP and Node work. So also, if you want to chat about anything Node or even C, I'm definitely game for that. All right, let's jump in here. We're going to cover exceptions, closures, namespaces, statics, short arrays, PDO, and security. Uh, we'll also dig into a little bit of the legit tools that PHP has now. For a while, uh, you know, Ruby, Python, all those cool kids got all the fun tools to make everything easier. PHP is finally jumping on board with that. So we now have a built-in web server, which we actually used in the workshop yesterday. It's a really quick way to jump in and get going. You know, instead of having to set up a whole LAMP stack or get Nginx running, you can just quickly type in a little command and have a working server. I'll show you that in a bit. We'll go through a little bit of Composer. Who here uses Composer? Knows what it is. All right, that's nice. OK. So it's been a nice trend over the past like two years, getting this talk at conferences. You see like maybe a quarter of the people raised their hand at first, and now it's really upticking. So this section will get removed soon, hopefully. And then we'll briefly cover unit testing. Nothing in depth at all. Um, just show you, uh, we'll talk about a couple of the tools available to PHP for it and show you what a test looks like, just so you're aware. <laughs> All right, so exceptions in PHP. What is an exception first off? An exception is really control flow. It's a way to handle when something goes wrong in your code. In the past, a lot of older PHP code is just kind of littered with return faults or set up this custom error message object and let's return that if we have an error, things like that. And so you really, as a consumer to another API, or say you're using a PHP SDK, you had no idea how to quite respond to an error unless you read through their code or read through their docs and really kind of hard-coded your solution to that. And so you were constantly checking the return codes from things to see how to handle that. What do I do next to my code? What does my workflow look like? With exceptions, you have a universal way to handle when something goes wrong. The exception you see here, which is your classic exception, class, so it covers all exceptions. You can also extend this class and create your own custom exceptions. So for example, if you're uh, writing payment processing code, you could have a you know, uh, bad expiration date or bad card number exception. So then in your code, when you go to use this, you would do a try, and then that you, your code goes here. So let's say that's uh, an SD, SDK call 
to authenticate, uh, say, a credit card, and that credit card fails, instead of having to check the return codes and do something else, you actually get an exception thrown from within that code, and you can catch that. So you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do, and if it fails, you're going to catch the exception that comes back. This example doesn't quite show you the beauty of it until you get into a large application, but when you have, say, five exception types that could be coming back, you can catch each one. And so you can completely change the workflow of your app to go through certain cases based on the exception that's called. Closures in PHP. Uh, closure, also known as an anonymous function, uh, there's slight differences if you want to break down what it is, but we don't care for this. Uh, it's basically just a function that's not named that you're going to use probably one time and throw away. So in this case, it's the function here. Um, routes are a great place where you're probably going to see this a lot in a lot of frameworks. This is an example from Laravel. We're defining a route. We had that get forward slash. We're saying the forward slash URL. And then once that's hit, once that's found, we got to do this thing. Previously in PHP, this would have probably been a, a name function that you name into a variable and then you call the variable, or you would do this a completely different way and you would just say, if route equals this, then go do this function method, right? Now with this, we can quickly just throw at this function and anytime this runs, we're gonna execute what's inside the function. Uh, one thing I try to caution on, this is great for the actual use case it's intended for. If you have something that needs to run this one path through, that's great. But if you had something where you need to repeatedly use it, or you had something where it needs to be instantiated in a class and it needs state, um, especially a lot of testing can be difficult with functional or with um, anonymous functions, don't try to use this ever just because it's cool or new or whatever. Use it for what it's intended for, something like this. But if you do need that class, that state, there's nothing wrong with still using that. This is an extra tool that's available to you but it's not meant to replace everything else. I'm going to caution that on a couple things here because I, I see that when PHP comes out with these new things, or any language does, people get excited about it, which is a great thing, but then you end up kind of shoehorning that solution in to places where it's not intended. So just because you have a new tool in your belt doesn't need, it doesn't need to be your only tool. Namespaces. Namespaces in PHP look like this. So here we're defining namespace illuminate console and then we have the class under that namespace. The idea of the namespace is that it gives you a container to put things under, and it keeps collisions from happening mainly, but it also gives you like actually clean functional containers. So class command, that's a pretty basic name for a class. If, uh, it's a pretty decent chance that you have a, like a big legacy app or an enterprise app, you might end up with two classes with the same name, especially if you're gonna pull in random modules or libraries that other people have written. You wouldn't want to have to go through every single class they have and make sure that there's no uh, overlap with what you have. So this gives us the ability to just use their container. They can name them whatever they want, sorry. And our names won't collide because we'll be in our own namespace. So we've got these nice little section blocks of how we can name and use code. Also, this gives us the ability to know which container we're in so we know where we're using the code from. If you want to use that namespace, that class, it looks like that. So just use eliminate console command. You'll see a lot of the examples in this talk are from Laravel, mostly just because I have the Laravel talk as well, so it's easier to copy and paste code between them. I'm lazy. Statics. Statics in PHP are a bit over abused, and the main reason I bring them up, they are not very new to PHP, but they went through a period where they were the new cool tool and everybody just used them everywhere for everything and it was horrible. So that's really kind of the main reason it's even here, is to really just caution you of it and so you know what it is when you see it. The way you define a static is like this public static function get. And then the way you would use that would be just with that uh, double colon there. What this does is it gives you the ability to group functions together but without having the overhead of a class or an object without having to instantiate it, and without that extra state inheritance on top of it either. This is great for like back in the day when you would have, um, say like helpers.php, and you would have 40 methods in there that were all helpers for whatever. Now you can have, you know, class equals whatever, say URL, 
and then you would have your URL helpers in there. Things that aren't necessarily mutating state, they're not a part of the bigger thing, they're just kind of in this category, and then they're one-off method to calls. So that's what that's for. Uh, when you're using a static, you have uh, no access to the this object that you're used to from a class. You have a couple things that are similar. You have var, or I'm sorry, self and static. Self is going to be your var definition and static is going to be your var execution. So that's uh, what the value is of that variable at a certain point in time. The short, yeah, I keep doing that. The short array syntax in PHP, also not something that's uh, a really big deal, but it's good for you to know it when you see it and also to know the errors that could be associated. This is how you used to define an array in PHP. It's just uh, array parentheses. Now you can do this, which uh, should look familiar if you use JavaScript or a myriad of languages that define arrays like this. It's nice because it's really just less typing, but it's also something to note. When if you see it, you'll know what you're looking at now. And also, if you hit an error, uh, if you try to use, say, like a PHP 5.5 library that's using this in your old PHP 5.3 app, you're going to see an error thrown. Um, if you see a syntax error thrown for this, that's probably what it is. You're probably using an older version of PHP. Either I bridge your PHP or you could swap these out for the old syntax. Traits. So these are something not many people seem to know about in PHP and they're really nifty for a certain use case. So in this case, we're defining a trait. We're going to name it base user. And we have a function that is a get name here. Here we're just returning a, a static string of the name. In, gen, you know, in real life, this would be a database call or whatever to return the name. Then we're going to define another user, an admin user, and we're going to use base user. So we have the trait here, and then we have an admin user that's using that trait. What this basically does is we have all our methods, and we're just going to shove them into the admin user class without having to retype them. So it keeps everything nice and dry, but you're not inheriting that. So you don't pull down the state from that trait. It's just kind of the static drop into that code. With that in place, we can now just instantiate a new admin user and then call get name, and we get that output. As you can see, we never defined get name as a method for that admin user. It was just in that base user, but then we can use it just like that. So it's a really nice way to reuse code without having to uh, use the inheritance model if that doesn't fit what you're doing. All right, PDO. No, no, I'm trying to see how much time I got. <laughs> All right, uh, PDO has been out for a while. There's still a lot of apps kind of lagging behind with it. It is a um, cross-system database management tool. Uh, it replaces the old like MySQL or MySQLi functions in P PHP, which you're probably most familiar with. Also replaces the PG functions if you use Postgres, things like that gives you a cross-system way to work with databases. These are just uh, the more popular databases it supports, although I have never used Informix, but apparently it's popular, because it's on their website, right? Um, the advantage here, which isn't a huge use case, but let's say you're developing a library that's going to be used for a lot of projects, maybe you're doing some kind of open source library. You need to be able to work with both, say, MySQL and Postgres, and instead of having to write your own drivers for each, or having different implementations for each, or trying to use SQL commands that would work for both of them, or what other kind of hacky solution people used to do, now you can use PDO. And if you stick with the mainline PDO functions, you prepare your statements, you use what it supports properly, you can be ensured that it will work across systems. So I can write my code once, and then I can know that when user X goes to use my library in Postgres, or user Y goes to use my library in MySQL, it'll still work. It also improves on the safe binding, and so that's going to help your security. So instead of having to call you know, MySQL real, real escape string everywhere, or just uh, dumping in variables and hoping that they're escaped properly, we can now bind parameters and this gives us a nice way to track both the naming of those and then also the execution paths of the SQL. That's what this looks like. So here we're going to prepare a statement. We had just select star from users. 
where ID equals, and then see that we're doing this uh, tokenized ID. So we're going to call an ID. And then we're going to bind param, and then we're going to call that name that we named it, and then we're going to throw the ID variable into it. Then we're going to execute that. So that's going to dynamically take that statement, inject it in with a properly escaped variable for that ID. All right. Quickly cover some security issues. This is uh, really just kind of the kind of really high level. What are some of the main security concerns you're going to see as you develop apps? Things to watch out for, things to keep in mind. We'll cover SQL injection, HTTPS, password hashing, authentication, safe defaults, and then uh, a couple of the common hacks that uh, you, you're probably going to see in your app, XSS and CSRF. All right, so this is uh, really what we just showed here. You should always escape your input. I'm using a PDO example here because you should use PDO. Uh, but you should also escape your output. So if you're going to throw output to the browser, you can't trust that just because you escaped it on the way in. So if somebody, um, say you have like a comment form, somebody throws some JavaScript in there, yeah, you're going to escape it when it goes to the database, so they won't be able to, say, uh, SQL inject you. They won't be able to change the actual SQL. But when you pull that out of the database, it's going to store that JavaScript. Um, in most cases, you're going to want to do HTML entities just before you throw anything to the screen, before you throw it to the browser. That's going to properly escape that. So if we were to have some JavaScript in that post name field, when it comes back out, uh, we'll properly escape that. So we won't execute the JavaScript in the browser. HTTPS, this is getting easier and easier every day. There's now some really low cost um, viable solutions for doing HTTPS. In general, uh, like years ago, this was kind of frowned upon because mostly just because it was expensive and it was slower. Um, your servers might not be as powerful, they might not be as co located, and um, the, the expense. You were looking at like one to two grand for a cert per server, right? Nowadays, super cheap. Most even DNS hosts will offer your solution to do it really cheaply for you. For example, like DNS Simple has like five bucks a month added to your domain name, and boom, you have SSL, things like that. The advantage of the SSL or HTTPS is that your traffic's encrypted across the wire. There's an additional negotiation step when you first make the connection. It's going to check to make sure, oh, is this, uh, is this who I think it is? Is this who they say they are? Yeah, they are. Okay, so we're going to encrypt all the traffic going back and forth. And you can be safe in knowing that, say, like usernames, passwords, things like that, that you might send back and forth to your users are encrypted. One thing to note there is don't throw anything you don't want exposed in the URL, because that URL is a part of the negotiation that happens when you're establishing the HTTPS connection. So if you don't want IDs exposed, or you don't want usernames and passwords, whatever you might throw in a URL, just don't put usernames and passwords in the URL, please. But anything you put in the URL is exposed. So just keep that in mind on HTTPS. It doesn't encrypt everything, but it encrypts the payloads. It encrypts the actual data. Also, uh, HTTPS is required by the OAuth 2 spec. It was not required by OAuth 1. So more and more, you're seeing anything that uses an API, anything that uses OAuth 2, moving to HTTPS. There's a pretty big uh, push in the community called HTTPS Everywhere. So instead of just trying to do HTTPS on your shopping cart or on your login pages, there's not really much reason. There's not much reason not to do, just do it everywhere now. Your performance impacts are very low, so just use it everywhere. That way, when the dev, say your junior dev, comes along a year later and adds a, you know little log login widget on some other page and forgets to add HTTPS there, you've suddenly just made your site insecure. But if you're just using it across the board, then you know you're going to be secure going forward. All right, always use access control for your pages. This is a little something to cover. I've seen a lot of places where people will maybe use access control before they generate links or generate the admin dashboard or weather place that you might click on to get to a page, but they don't double check that when they view the page. This leaves you open to somebody either guessing or knowing and typing in a URL and then accessing content. Also, anywhere that you perform an action that someone needs a certain access rights to do, you should double check that. So if you're letting someone, say, delete a user, just because they were able to trigger that delete action doesn't mean they had access to it. They could have found a way to trigger that. 
So make sure you double check it before you perform the action. Before you perform the update on your database, double check their access. Also, you should have the rate limiting in place to prevent brute force. Brute force is the easiest way to compromise just about any login page. And that just means I'm going to try this 400,000 times with the most common passwords that I'm probably going to get in. You can't always protect that because you can't stop your users from entering stupid passwords that are easy to guess. But you can make it harder. The best way to make it harder is just to make it take longer. Because if it takes longer, it's more expensive, basically. You have to throw more hardware at it. You have to keep the servers up for longer. You can hack as many users. Um, the way to do that is just with uh, rate limiting. So maybe only allow five login attempts every 60 seconds, or whatever fits your use case. That's going to be different based on your site, based on your API, whatever you're doing. But just make sure you, you don't just leave that unrestricted. There should be a restriction to how many attempts you can make to do something in a certain amount of time. So PHP now, I believe it was Swift 5.5, has uh, password hashing built in. So instead of having to learn about encryption, instead of having to roll your own crypto, which we all know is a bad thing, right? It's now built into PHP. Currently, it's using bcrypt, but it's set up in a way that when the, uh, when the crypto community comes out with a new standard for what's best to encrypt with, PHP can move to that, and you can upgrade automatically. So this is what it looks like, password hash. And in this example, we're just doing post pass. So that's the password the user types in. We're going to throw that to the password hash function. And then it's going to return back an encrypted string for us. That's going to include a, uh, a key and the, the hash, the uh, assault and the hash. Then we also have the password verify. So here, what we're passing to password verify, this is, uh, say, the user comes back in with their login page. They type it in, and then we're going to go pull that data from the database. That's what you're seeing with that U pass. And then we have the post pass that they're passing with their login form. We're going to take that plain text password. We're going to compare it against the hash we have in the database using password verify, and then it'll return back and let us know if that's correct. This is uh, not rocket science, but if you've ever tried to implement a login page or crypto on your own, before using a library, before this was included, it was just really hard and there's a lot to learn. And it's, it's very scary and dangerous because you don't know what you're doing, you can really screw it up. Using this uh, new functionality of PHP makes it super easy. There's also uh, another function you can do to check to see if you're on the latest encryption. So when we move from bcrypt to whatever the next thing is, PHP will tell you, OK, so this, this hash that's in our database is using the old one. We need to upgrade it. So then you can just rehash it while you have that plain text password. You call password hash again to up it to the new encryption level. And so you're automatically staying up to date with the latest encryption every time your user logs in. Always use safe defaults in your code. This is kind of like CS101, but a lot of people still don't do it. I even mess up with this a lot of times just because I'm in a rush. Um, you should always define any variable you're going to use before you use it, usually at the top of your classes or at the top of your files. And you should go ahead and set, even though PHP is not uh, type safe, you should go ahead and set the types that it's going to be. That way you know what to expect going forward. So in this case, var one is going to be a string. So we're going to go ahead and just set that. You would probably set it to an empty string. But you should set it to something. So in this case, we're going to have the default value. So we'll set it to default value. This helps in a lot of places. It's really going to help in your troubleshooting. Um, Mostly because, let's say we're going into a loop and we expect it to be something, but we didn't set it yet. Oh, why is that null? If you already had it defined as a default, you can just check against the default and really see how that logic's flowing and see that you still have the default. It's a little hard to explain without a, a concrete case, but I promise it'll save your ass later. This is uh, an example with a loop. So here we're just defining the bool before we go into the loop so that we know it's always false when we start. And then it can be mutated later to be a true. Oh, uh, one second. I am running out of time. We're going to go faster. We'll skip this. We'll skip all this. All right, the widget tools in PHP. This is the built in PHP server. Uh, we just run it php s localhost 8000. That's going to start up the server and whether directory you point it to or whatever directory you're running from. 
That way you don't have to set up Apache, you don't have to set up Nginx, any of that. You just run this and get started. Composer, we all, almost all use this, but we'll cover it just for the few people that don't. It is same package management for PHP. You might have used Pear back in the day, and that was horrible, so this is a much better solution. It has a way to define versions. It has a way to lock to certain versions. It's also project specific. So instead of having packages that are shared across your whole installation, they're going to be defined just for your project. It also has auto loading milled in, so you don't have to worry about where is the path to this certain file via PSR 0 or whatever that changed to, PSR 4. It um, knows where to find the files and auto load them when you try to use the class. Packages.org is going to be the name, main place you want to go and look for new packages. It's uh, kind of the central repository for it right now. Composers also, you can run your own Composer server. So if you want one just for your company, you're not limited to just what's available on the web publicly. What this looks like is you have the Composer JSON file. You require the modules you want, and then you set the version. So in this case, we're doing versions of Dev Master. You can also set, you know, 4.x or 4.0.0 or whatever you want to set in particular. This will create a composer.lock file, which is where a lot of the magic of this comes in. And that lock file is the exact versions you have. When you go to uh, work on a repo with other people, you'll commit the lock file, and then they can update their source code just based on the lock. That way you know all your developers and your servers are all running on the same versions. Gets rid of a lot of the whole like, oh, but I'm on version three, you're on version four, kind of problems you're going to run into in a team environment. If you run uh, Composer for update, that's going to go look at your Composer JSON file and go update everything to the newest versions. If you run Composer for install, that's going to look at the lock file and pull down what's in that. The update will update the lock file as well. So that's great if you know you have some time to kill, or there's a new version of something you want to try. You go update, get the new version of it, and then you can commit back that lock file so that everyone else can get on the same page later. Again, with auto loading, you're just going to call the class name, and then it's going to know where to find that file. Go require it for you, pull it in. You don't have to worry about the whole path. Unit testing in PHP, there's lots of tools for it. The main ones you're going to see are probably be PHP unit and codeception. Um, there's also Bay Hat if you want to use like BUD in PHP. You can use Selenium directly, but that's more for integration testing. What we're going to cover here is PHP unit. That's what you're going to see most. It looks like this. So you define a class and you extend your PHP unit class. And then we're going to just define something that tests something. So here we're instantiating a new auth class, and then we're going to check that it verifies. Here we're doing assert true. That's kind of where the magic is. We're going to assert that whatever we're calling here returns true. And if it doesn't, we'll fail it. Um, there's lots of options for how you test things. You can assert different things. But in this case, we're just going to make sure that off verify always verifies and returns true. This is how you go through and make sure that your code does do what you expect it to do without having to have a user or yourself click through your whole app every time. You can run your test suites to make sure that everything works. You run that from the command line. In this case, we're just doing PHP unit test. Then you can see the output. We ran one test. We asserted one thing, and they were both OK. Sorry for rushing through this. We're just out of time. We have to get out of the venue soon. Uh, some resources you want to check out is php.net, some modern frameworks. I really recommend checking out the code to some modern frameworks, not necessarily using them. Uh, it depends on your needs. But if you're trying to figure out something or see what's new in PHP, how are people handling this similar issue, go, go read the code for some frameworks that are out there and see how they're handling it. It's going to give you a good idea of how you might solve the problem yourself, even if you're not using their framework. Also, PHP the right way. It's both a website and a book. The book's a couple bucks. The website's free. People contribute to this and say, hey, so this is a rather opinionated version of how I solved this problem with PHP. It's kept up to date. It's a very recent resource. So it's not going to be like when you Google and find something from five years ago, and that's outdated. It's going to be something new and kept up to date with the best way of how to do certain things. Then also, as promised, uh, PHP Oz is the code. You get three bucks off my book. It's just buildsecurephpapps.com. And we are not doing Q&A. If you could uh, hit up joined in and rate my talk, 
Just, just give me feedback on what's good, what's bad, what I can improve on, or any questions you had. Also, I'll be around after this if you want to ask any questions. Oh, we can? OK. Cool. All right, Q&A. Questions? If there is any. Tough <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Actually, I have one. Okay. Just because. So, um, something that um, would be worth touching on is, and this is sort of out of the scope of your talk, but it, you kind of touched on it, is the occasions where you would you would go for inheritance over using a trait. I've seen some people just discover traits and like you said, they just mm -hmm. go trade everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then w like where, where you would find, you would use each of those sort of um, decisions, you know, like which way you yeah. would. Yeah, so when I usually use it is when I have something that's a common action, but it's not a common resource or a common object. I'm trying to think of a real world example. So in this case, we're getting the name in something. Maybe we get the name in something for users and for blogs and for statuses or whatever we might have that's disparate objects but they're not all of the same type. They wouldn't be the same class that we want to inherit from, but they share, the, they share code. Um, so in that case, we can use a trait to basically inject that code into all these different disparate objects, these disparate types. And so we get to reuse that code without having to have some kind of weird base type that doesn't really apply to these other items. That make sense? Cool. Cool, Ben Edmonds, thank you. Thank you, everyone.